say hello. And usually I like write out this whole big introduction thing. And for Brandy, I I didn't. <laughs> but I want I want um, to just say I'm super happy and grateful that we got Brandy with us tonight, our author, our real work guru. Um, really, um, very very happy about this because we're celebrating her and her new book. We're also celebrating the fact that she wrote this book with purpose and that we can all learn from everything that she has in this book. Um, and, and I'm just like, just happy that we have people in the room, like very excited about that. This is the first time in over, well, it's been like quite two years, I think. But we're here, we started this meetup, we've always been virtual, it was like a COVID thing. But very happy to see people I've seen before, that I've participated before, that I've also um, been able to work with in one fashion or the other, or have previous speakers. And um, I'm just delighted that you're here, the new people that have never been at a before, and people that are coming back, and people online as well. So really, really thrilled that we have this group. This is um, really intended to be interactive. So Brandy's going to talk about some of the why and fundamentals about, of, um, you know, you can look my stuff, you guys, if you want. Jeff's nice. He does yeah, that. I, I found that. Nice. She don't meet in person. This is her first time at a meetup in person. But uh, she's going to talk about fundamentally, like, what, what questions I have for her, like, like, well, how did you, how did you get to this point? Or like, how did you, so what have you done? I, I briefly kind of, like, Interacted with Brandy when we were both with Wells Fargo when we were in And um, it wasn't enough. I mean, like three seconds is not enough for Brandy. Um, and so I'm really happy that she's in our community, that she's like one of those uh, vibrant participants in things, and that she'll share with us today and ask questions like, what? What bothers you about some of the obstacles in your organization? What bothers sure. you about um, not being able to maybe feel anything other than exhausted? Um, how do you like again? How do you stay like you know in a state of wellness? You know, like how do you do that? <laughs> Self care. It's really like we have experts here, so experts here. And so um, thank you all, thank you all very much for coming out in like slightly on our weather and responding to um, our request to like see if we can do this in person thing because it's really delightful to be able to be together. Yes. Okay, cool. Well, so for those of you who are joining us, um, we get to see your faces and um, I will acknowledge that we will like imperfectly interact on video and in person, because that's a challenge, but we'll do our best. Who in the room is checking the chat in Zoom? Is somebody, is that me? You, okay. So if you put something in the chat, Cheryl will be your voice. And um, the other thing that I will say is, this is a conversation, right? And so if you have, if we've spent time together before, you know that I am not one for, um, big speeches and lectures, but what I really love and what I'm excited to um, be able to help with tonight is to create conversations because we all have something to give and we all have something to receive. And as we look at how we are learning together and how we're doing real work, because the thing that matters most to me is that the only place that we get to do real work is in reality. And so the sooner we understand what that looks like and how to connect with each other in that place, we get to move on to the work that matters most. And I just think at the beginning and end of the day, there's an abundance of good work to be done. And we don't have time and we can't afford to waste the energy that we have and how we collaborate. So that's what I really care about. I'm excited to be part to have this conversation. And it is going to be a conversation because we were we had a kind of different game plan. Um Polly Skaya was going to join us and we had a you know, whatever, a, a different plan, and then she's homesick. So it's, it's a conversation that we're going to have, and I'm winging it a little bit as we go. Um, also, you guys are all staring at me. So that feels, so um, we, we hopefully were gonna, we're going to move to tables. So. Yeah, if you want to move your chair around, that's good. Um, but here's the question I want to open up with. 
Um, the question I want to open up with is I want you to, to invite you to think about your change capital. And this is something that I love to check in on because we each have what I like to think about as change capital. We have a, um, an ability to navigate and respond to change as humans. And a lot of times when we start talking about change, we talk about how humans aren't so good at change or we're really resistant to change. And the reality is we're exceptionally um, well equipped for change. We have change capital, we can respond to change. It's limited, but it's renewable, right? So we can't respond to infinite change all the time without having our resources depleted, but we can expand our change capital as individuals and then as organizations. So I wanna invite you to just think about like where you're at right now with your own change capital. If you imagine, you know, a container of change capital and you can have it all spent and have just a little bit left in your savings account, um, to spend, or you might be flush with um, capital for change. So I just want to invite you to like, think about that for yourself. And then the question I'm going to ask you to think about and to, to just start to share is, think about your team or your organization or the people you work with. Where do you think your collective change capital is right now? So I'm going to invite you to like, thinking about the people you work with or the space that you work with, like just to mystify, and you guys can do this um, on Zoom too. Five is an abundance of change capital, right? You just got like an extra payday and maybe that means you're part of an organization or a team that is really energized to be doing some new things right now. Maybe you're doing something really innovative and, and it's really energizing. You've got a lot of capacity for changing the way you're working. Five, like three might be, you know, maybe average, right? Like you're doing the work, you're going along, but like people are feeling pretty good about where you're at right now as a group, as a team, your organization, the people you work with. A one would be like, we're pretty exhausted in our change capital. A zero might be we're running on fumes. There is no capital left in our change account and we're struggling. So this to five, the people you work with, however you define that, um, where do you think collectively you're at with your change capital? How much um, capital do you have in your collective change account? I have two hands. You have two hands, lots of change capital well, available. This is, this is one group. Oh, because you got two groups, got it. I thought you were like, okay, wait, show those hands again. Show those hands again. Two, four, three, four. I was asking you to think about your like work environment, right? So people you work with collectively. Would it, I, you, gotta, you gotta hold your hands up a little longer. Fours, okay, threes, variety, right? One of the things that I've been noticing in having conversations a lot recently with groups and teams is this, right? We, we have a little bit more capacity. Like we're not necessarily collectively, um, if you think about where you were a year ago or two years ago, we were reminiscing about um, early pandemic days, which is the last time any of us saw each other and how unrelenting and overwhelming that change was, right? As we were having to navigate and respond to all sorts of changes. I was working with an organization at the time that was um, about to embark on a big organizational redesign. And the pandemic unfolded and they chose not to move forward with their organizational redesign at that moment because they were suddenly trying to figure out how to work remotely and they'd never done that before. And they, the leadership group recognized that their change capital was gone. They had, they had to spend it on figuring out how to work remotely on the reality that everyone on their team was also figuring out right how to work remotely with kids at home and with all sorts of things happening because as humans, we just get our one human self. So if we're dealing with a lot of change personally, it's gonna impact our capacity for change work and our team. So they totally put on hold their um, organizational redesign because they figured this is probably not the right time to figure out how to work with a new manager that you've never reported to before. But things ebb and flow and they shift and they change. One of the things that is come up a lot in conversations that I've had recently is people recognizing that especially among managers and leaders that the way that they were leading through the pandemic is no longer serving them. When you have a crisis and your change capital is evaporated, what you need from your leaders is 
clear direction, right? There's a crisis, there's a disaster, you need clear direction, and this is how we're gonna solve it, and this is how we're gonna stop the bleeding and make sure we've got everybody accounted for. And that kind of leadership, when you move out of that crisis, isn't necessarily at all what helps you solve other kinds of problems. And so talking into an understanding that people are transitioning right now, and kind of understanding how does it, how do we recognize that we're not out of a pandemic, um, but yet it's also shifting and changing. And what do we do now with the capital, our change capital, the investments for change that we have, and how do we use that? It's coming up over and over again. You have a comment here that's really Please share. Nice. Uh, personally, my change account is getting tough ramen to get by. <laughs> the organization is probably a seller. Yeah, so where we're at individually, right? So if you didn't hear that, personally, my change account is eating Top Ramen to get by. It's a little exhausted, running um, on just the bare basics to keep going. So one of the things that we can start to think about is how do we expand or renew our change capital? Because it isn't fixed. It's limited, right? Um, we can spend it and we have to, we run out of it, but it's not fixed. We can renew it and we can expand it. How we show up, how we manage our work, how we manage our priorities, how we engage with each other helps us to expand our change capital or um, shrink it. And we also each come to the work of being a human and responding to change differently. Some of us love change and we thrive, whatever the change is, right? We thrive in change and we have a huge capacity for it because we love it. We thrive in times of change, and others of us, not so much. Our capacity for how much change we can manage at any given time is more limited, is smaller, right? And so how we navigate that really, really makes a difference. So um, with that, I'm kind of curious, and then we'll start to kind of build some ideas together. When you think about your own capacity for change, so not like necessarily where your bank account is for change capital, but your capacity for where you sit on the spectrum. You love change. Change brings progress. It's amazing. It fuels, you know, learning and adaption. And that's really energizing for you. That's kind of one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum might be more change disrupts relationships and it disrupts tradition and routines. And it's not bad that you feel that way, but change tends to be feel more disruptive to things that create harmony and, and stability. You can be everywhere in between. So I'm kind of curious where you're at on that spectrum and, and where you would identify yourself, your own, and how big your change bucket is. So on the one end of the spectrum, change brings progress. It's always great, usually, right? Good things happen when things start to change. That would be on this end of the spectrum. Um, huge change capital capacity. So I would give that a five. Right. And on the other end of the spectrum is maybe a, like a one. And I don't want to frame that as a bad thing by any means, but just the, the amount of change you can navigate or you like to or prefer to navigate at any time is more limited. Your work or your change in progress limit is smaller. Where would you like put yourself on that spectrum? How, how much change in progress can you do you like to manage? Five, two. Seen some threes and some twos, but fours, 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 lots of fours and fives, right? Six, seven, eight, hyper change rate. Those of us that love and gravitate towards agility, right? We tend to be especially eager for learning and change because we see it as something that helps us learn and grow and brings progress and we love it, right? The, People that we work with may not all find themselves on the same end of that spectrum. And that all comes together in this space to say like, we only have our one human selves to show up and do work. So how do we get that real work done together? And how do we continue to respond to the change, right? That's the theme of the night, respond to that change, whatever is coming, because wherever we find ourselves on the spectrum, um, the reality is change, is as Margaret Wheatley says, our ever constant companion, right? It doesn't go away. And so we have to figure out how to navigate that together, how to continue to be responsive without burning ourselves out, without sacrificing our well being, and um, in a way that allows us to continue to pursue excellence and um, great outcomes. Because the reality is that if we 
are pursuing great outcomes at the expense of our own well being, for burning ourselves out, our success is really short lived and it's not sustainable. So that's the conversation we want to kind of open up tonight. Um, and I hope that this is a, I'm going to draw something on the board and we're going to start to talk about it. Okay. So we often think about our ability to respond to change, or, well, our well being, right? We often think about our well being and um, our, where we're at on the burnout spectrum. I'm going to say like well being is the opposite of burnout. Um, we think about that as often in tension with how we respond to change or the expectations that we have. I'm just going to pull this up. Oh, pull it up there. Yeah, there we go. I mean, uh, it's zoomed in, but it doesn't really. It's not, very, it's not zoomed in very much. Okay. So I can do the more. Okay. So so just shove it over. How is this? I don't want to like block all the beautiful faces yeah, no. just on our so screen. Is that better? You yeah. can. Okay, so a lot of times we think about well-being, high expectations and performance as being on opposite ends of the spectrum, that if we have greater well-being, we have to accept less um, in terms of performance or expectations. Or if we're in an environment where we have high expectations um, and we're a high performer, that that must, you know, inherently means that we have to make sacrifices in terms of our well-being. The reality is that's not sustainable, right? And so one of the ways that I like to write and talk and think about this is that it's really more on a beautiful two by two grid because so many wonderful things are better understood this way, right? That the idea that high well being and high expectations go hand in hand together. And that if the expectations we have cause us to sacrifice our well being in the process, they're not the right expectations. And they're not the things that are going to lead to truly sustainable performance and, and good outcomes over time. And that's ultimately the reason why I started writing and teaching about this was because I was seeing more and more how the way that we're designing our organizations and leading. It's putting people in the positions where they have to choose between doing good work and their own well-being. And that in most cases, that's a false choice that exists only because of the way we design our organizations, that people have to make that choice. Unless you actually work for Doctors Without Borders or a peacekeeping team where your job is actually to go into conflict zones where your life very well may be on the line um, in order to do your work. In the majority of cases, having to make that choice between good work and self-sacrifice it's Paul's choice is getting in the way of doing the good work that matters. So I really want to um, create spaces where we can reframe the conversation and say that high performance actually means how we sustain our outcomes over time, not just how we beat our competitor in the current quarter. Um, because the organizations and the groups and the companies that are really able to lead are the ones that can sustain their performance over time. So we've got this expectations. Yeah, and low well-being. Okay, so when you have high well-being and low expectations, I call that the vacation zone. We all need that sometimes. It feels nice, we're very happy, we're relaxed, there's very little expected of us um, being unplugged from work, right? Or whatever else is causing us to have to, you know, perform. Low expectations and low well-being, that combination, whether it's in our personal lives, whether it's in our work and our teams, ultimately that's where we're ineffective. We could come up with lots of better words for that. But nothing really good can come out of that, right? When we have low well-being and high expectations, how about the burnout zone? That's when we can't, what we can't sustain. If we're in an environment that is expecting us to perform in a way that causes us to sacrifice our well-being, we're gonna burn out. We might be able to do that for a time, but we're not gonna be able to sustain that. 
and, um, and nor are the outcomes that are gonna happen from that going to be um, what we're actually capable of, right? So we have the space of high well-being and high expectations. And I call that the performance zone. And one of the reasons why I like this zone up here in the corner is because it helps us understand that what's possible is unlimited. When we work in a way that allows us to have high well being and high expectations for what's possible, we have this like exponential possibility. That's when humans as people thrive, um, when we're able to really bring our full creative selves to the work that we're doing. So I'm curious with this, I want us to like shout out and fill out um, this grid a little bit more with behaviors and things that happen in our organizations and the places that we work. That's the teams that we work with, the organizations that we're with, where we're coaching, consulting, that create these zones that we all as humans then have to show up and try to navigate. So let's start with um, something like low expectations and low well being. What are actions and behaviors, circumstances that you see in organizations, whether you've participated in them or observed them, that create this environment, an environment of low expectations? that results in low well-being, that we're, we're ineffective. What are some of the qualities of that? I would say unclear roles and responsibilities. Unclear roles. Is that kind of what you're looking for? Yeah, exactly, right? How can you have clear, high expectations if you have unclear roles and responsibilities? Um, yeah, what else? What else creates the ineffective zone? You don't know the why. You don't know the why. Do you want to say a little bit more about that, Craig? Um, yeah, you put a bunch of people together here, build stuff for what? Well, to make the world better. That's still not even why. Right? Mm -hmm. In what way? Yes. Um, it's about that vision. Mm -hmm. it's where you talk to a big creative. Yeah, because like you can be in that environment where there feels like there's a lot of high pressure. You could even be in that environment where it feels like there's high expectations. There's this expectation that you keep producing, that you do work, that you work hard, that you never stop, but you don't actually have an expectation there. Or you have an expectation that is causing someone to sacrifice their well-being and it doesn't actually work, right? So like what we even mean when we say expectations comes into being. What else? How about another um, characteristic that helps us? Yeah. Lack of appreciation or reward. Lack of appreciation, yeah. I can't spell quite. And I would draw this over and say like that, that cuts across. That's a low well-being characteristic. When you are working hard um, and there's lack of appreciation or even reward, like that just intrinsic um, outcome for the work, right? You're working hard, but you're not getting anywhere. We talk, Sometimes I talk about that as like the difference between treading water and swimming across the lake. Um, it can feel like you're working just as hard. You can actually expend more calories um, treading water, but you're not getting anywhere, right? You're not moving forward. So that's great. I mean, I think in there is that lack of support. So you might be, you know, there might be some expectations, you don't really understand them, but there again, you don't know what you're supposed to do. And that's connected again to that why, right? Yep. But it could even be from a, you know, here's here's a role you're telling me about, but I don't have the skills to do that. Yep. And that's another one that I would draw over here too. The expectations could be really high and it could be super clear what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and if you don't have the support, the skills, the environment that you need to achieve that, you're going to have diminished low, low well-being, right? It's not going to feel very good. Okay, so how about um, vacation zone, right? We know vacation, but what about work? Like, has anyone ever been part of a team or seen a team that's maybe operating a little bit in this, like, low-achieving vacation zone? Oh, we got a hand up. <laughs> Amy. 
Jamie, you've experienced that? <laughs> what are some of the qualities, Jamie, of the vacation zone at work? What happens? Uh, <clears throat> kind of like a, not much is expected. So like if um, something is due at like, I don't know, some point in time, they say, oh, okay, well, you need more time? Okay, no problem. You know, that's not looked upon as a, as an issue, you know, there's no deadlines or no, no consequences to any, to any kind of, you know, misses on dates or milestones yeah. or anything. Like no accountability, right? Like that's what I think of, you know, maybe there's, there's a lot of expectation I, on that, but there's no accountability for it. Um, no, I, I, so yeah, I guess accountability is part of it, but it's more, I think, um, from what I've seen more management that's um, so in the case to be more specific the developers are very niche right and so if you push them too hard they'll go somewhere else mm. and so there's this kind of fear from management that if we are going to be setting timelines setting deadlines stressing them out too much they're going to go somewhere else so in a way it's this game I think that the employees play with management mm. and <clears throat> so they know they have the upper hand essentially they're, they're not okay. like ignorant of that okay what else what else makes for a vacation zone i think it's that niche thing to some degree as mm. well like somebody wants to hold the information and you've got other people to help Mm. but they're not letting them. Okay. You know, so maybe oh. something like that. Well, certainly like maybe disempowering, you know, the opposite, whatever the opposite of that empowering is to be. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot is this idea around quiet quitting. And I've been like mulling over it for weeks and months and thinking like, I probably have something to say about this, but I don't know what it is. And it landed for me this week in a conversation that I was having with a group that I was, coaching because one of the things that I felt about the conversation on quiet quitting is we shouldn't be so afraid of it right or it's not so like the idea that you have boundaries at work isn't a bad thing but what I realized the problem with quiet quitting is it's about it's um doing less with apathy and it's the apathy piece that like just because I'm all about boundaries limiting work in progress working in the amount of time that you can work so it's sustainable because it is so much healthier for an organization to have people who stick around year after year than to have constant turnover, right? I love boundaries at work. Um, but this idea of quiet quitting just has continued to grate at me. And I, I started to realize this because it's this idea of doing less with apathy as opposed to doing less with strategic intention. Um, and the, even the idea that we have to frame doing less as a negative thing, just reveals how deeply ingrained in our culture is the idea that more is more, right? So even to talk about boundaries at work, it needs to be talked about as quiet quitting, um, means and just reveals that we have these like really deeply ingrained ideas about what it means to be successful and to be a high performer. And there's such a huge difference between doing less with apathy because you're just checked out and you don't care um, or you're just going to show up and fly under the radar and doing less because it has adds value, right? Um, and that's a huge difference. And so I, I think that that fits in here at work. The vacation zone probably winds up being something more like the quiet quitting zone, right? Because you can just fly under the radar, do your thing. Nobody's going to notice and nobody's maybe going to care. Or if you're a leader, you wind up being afraid of that. Right? I think there's also this dynamic that goes on right now from managers and leaders that we can't afford anybody to quit because it's killing us in terms of how much the turnover is costing us. We can't afford to have high expectations because people might quit, right? And so that keeps us in many, many teams in this place of low expectations. And then you're either in low expectations in the vacation zone or in low expectations um, in the ineffective zone, right? So, so let's talk about the burnout zone, right? What are the characteristics of a team and organization that create a burnout zone environment? Perhaps there's high expectations. Perhaps the why is super clear. Um, perhaps there are clear roles and responsibilities. 
Um, so we have high expectations, but we have low well-being. What causes high expectations to create low well-being? Death march. What was that, Ryan? Death march. Tell me more about a death march. Well, it's where leadership has unrealistic expectations that the teams can't, even in the wildest dreams, achieve. Mm. And uh, so they end up uh, just marching, and they're very unhappy. Uh, because they can't achieve it. Yeah. At the risk of um, offending my daughter and also Craig, I might call that unicorn land, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, right, that's the place where like our high expectations just put us so totally outside of the boundaries of reality, um, which can result in not feeling happy in fairy tale like the land of unicorns, um, but just causing that burnout, right? What else? What else create? What else is true in an environment where we have high expectations and low well-being? So more and more and more, it's a matter of your scope changes and so it changes. And that even happens in agile mm -hmm. More? More and more. I heard that today. Mm. Not from my fabulous presenter. Because we're guys. <laughs> what else? What else do you see creates that brain out zone? Fear. Fear. And those aren't necessarily inherently bad things, right? Like we're, you know, you don't want to lose trust. You don't want to be on the hot seat, right? The environment shouldn't be producing that, but it it's very real and valid. What else? Being uh, micromanaged. High expectations with lots of micromanaging creates a lot of low well-being. Yep. Those are those really high expectations. Those are just people not trusting you doing your job that they hired you to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe we it winds up putting us over here, right? That's one of the things that I think is if if the expectations we're setting in our organizations are causing harm. So the people who are showing up to do the work, then they are the wrong expectations. And they aren't what's going to actually lead us to high performance, which is about you know, sustaining better outcomes over time. Um, and so I think there's a lot of ways that we mistake high expectations for things that they aren't, right? High expectations just being more output, high expectations meaning just competing with your competitors. What a low bar to set that you just want to catch up to your competitors, right? In this zone, you're just going, like there's a ceiling to what's possible um, when you accept low well-being as the inevitable price to pay for your high expectations or your outcomes. There's a ceiling. You're never gonna achieve what you're actually capable of. You'll never know what you're actually capable of. And I think there's so many ways that we accept that ceiling and we accept expectations that are actually far too low from what we're actually capable of. It's not the problem that our expectations are too high. And most of our organizations is that they're already too low and we let it sit as a ceiling for what's possible. So to go with Cheryl's comment of always more the lack of prioritization. Mm -hmm. Like in your book, you talk about an exercise where you had people, executives prioritize and then they came back and told them, well, you just put these Actually, yes, which happens so frequently. Yes, which I forgot I have stickers I'm supposed to be handing out, but this one right now. <laughs> You'll all get stickers. Get the nail stickers too. That's yes. what do we have to do to get a sticker? Answer a question, which many of you have already done. <laughs> More stickers will go around, but now you know. Um, Right, the idea that we've prioritized because we've identified what's important. You can, one of the reasons that I started writing, and I am not a writer, people. I am like a teacher, I'm an interactor, I'm a facilitator, I'm not a writer by like, you know, innate nature. But I started writing because I started to see how the fact that everything can be important, right? You can strip away all the unimportant things and still be left with more to do than your human capacity allows you to do at any given time. Now you start to dig into that and you find there's a whole lot of things that we think are important that you know, maybe actually aren't adding the value we think that they are. 
but you can still be in this position where um, you're dealing with so much important work. You know, I work with organizations that are um, you know, working with agencies and nonprofits that help people end homelessness. They, you know, one of my clients in um, 2020, they ran the databases that help drive decisions about um, how to measure and understand homelessness and what our activities we were doing was impacting that, the, data, the statewide database there. At the end of the day, all of their work had real people who either had homes or didn't or were gonna be impacted by policy choices that were being made. The work they were doing really mattered. Um, I'm working with an organization right now that you know, measures their success in terms of lives saved. Talk about high stakes. Talk about making an environment where it's really hard to experiment and adapt to change because lives are on the line and that's how they measure their success. We're working on that. They need some other tools to measure whether their things are effective or not because it's too high stakes to just always be measuring things by people's life or death reality. Um, we can do really important work and still be in this position where everything is important. We found 10 things that truly are, but it still isn't the same as prioritization. And the reality is if the work we're doing is important, prioritization matters not because, or not in spite of it being important, but because it's important. And if we really need to get it all done, if those dates really matter, great. The way to deal with getting that work done by those dates is to right, prioritize. What else? What else do you see that creates this burnout zone? Right? Brandy, so many of us work in that. Brandy, yeah. I would add uh, psychological safety or lack of. Like yeah. uh, having an environment where people feel uh, like they're going to get a reprisal for, for going against the grain or saying something that's not what uh, got the blessing from yeah. above. A hundred percent. Talk about something that either renews our change capacity or causes it to shrink. Our experience of psychological safety and trust in the place that we work will either ex help us to expand or shrink. Um, our, our capacity and our capital for change, 100%. What else, Jamie, it looks yes. like you have thought. The other thing that, I, that I've that uh, i noticed too is it's almost like a, it's almost like a self-wish. So I've seen people that tell me I'm really busy. I have a lot to do. I have a lot of going on and they're stressed out. But when you try to pin them down on what they're actually working on, they can't tell you. It's mm. almost like they want to keep themselves busy because they're afraid of something, afraid of getting passed up for promotion, afraid of losing their job. Uh, I just, I don't know, or it's part of their nature. I don't, I, I, I don't know necessarily what it is psychologically. And I'm sure it's all of those for any number of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's the opposite spectrum of, you know, quitting and failing to give notice, right? So it's, it goes on the opposite end of your, your chart. But yeah, there's some oh. people that just are busy to be busy. Yeah, without well, any purpose. That's such a you know a good insight, and it there's a lot of research to back that up, right? So there's a lot of research that shows that we perceive people who are busy to be more powerful. I attended this really fascinating workshop on the politics of time this fall, and one of the things that they talked about there is how we allow some people to have more power with time. So a CEO can come late to a meeting and we perceive that the reason they're late is because they're busy and important. There are other important things. If a project manager comes late to a meeting, we assume that they're really bad with time management. They don't have the privilege to arrive after the clock says that they should arrive. And we perceive that to be a negative attribute for them, right? But the CEO, the director, the famous you know, athlete, whoever that is, they have more power with time, right? Uh, um, there's a ton of research, and I share a lot of it in the book too, about how we conflate busyness with importance. Um, that it, we perceive that people who need to check their email while they're on vacation are more important than people who don't need to check their email while they're on vacation. Um, there's so many ways that we conflate this, that busyness with more and with importance. So it's a real factor because if that's the world that we're swimming in, whether we agree or not, we absorb those ideas and we have to make them really explicit so we can reject them. That's the world we're swimming in. We're headed to burnout, it's right? Swimming upstream too. We're swimming upstream. It's, yeah, I mean, all sorts of metaphors, right? For how ineffective that is. Brandy, okay. my, my yeah. other full-time job is actually an animal rescue. Ooh. And in 2021, animal rescue was totally in the performance zone just, you know, totally kicking butt and 
cruising mm. and doing amazing work. Um, 2022, it just all came crashing right down. Mm. And it's the worst year since I've been involved um, in animal rescue since like 2008. Um, and so now everybody is in the burnout zone. Suddenly mm. there are just so many animals that need help and not enough money and not enough people to adopt them. And just, you know, so it's, it's somewhat relative though, because we were doing, you know, on such a high last year that it feels like a lower low this year. Hmm. So I'm curious then Cheryl, like, you know, so some of those are external factors, right? Which is part of the agility piece. Change is ever always with us. There is an abundance yeah. of important work to do. Um, what do you think enabled like that performance zone where things just clicked and flowed and you felt like you were accomplishing a lot. What do you think enabled that that maybe is missing from what you're experiencing now? In our case, it was actually COVID. When people were um, spending more time at home, they all adopted pets. Mm. They all went back to work and wanted to go back on vacations this year and they all gave up their pets. Mm -hmm. I can't, we kept our pet too. <laughs> sure. So like external circumstances. So like capacity, collective capacity was maybe increased. Mm -hmm. So then you think about like, as an organization, if you're that organization and you're in the um, mission of animal rescue, and you went from this like great high where everybody was invested in your mission and coming mm -hmm. alongside you and donating money, mm -hmm. um, had lots of capacity. And then that dries up. Yep. If you're that organizational leader, what options do you have? What actions can you take to keep your team in the performance zone, which is high well-being and high expectations? What can you do as that leader, right? Because I, I mean, pick animal rescue, but we can replace that with a variety of organizations. What actions can you do if you're that leader? All of these external things are changing. What can you do to keep your team in a high per, in a performance zone? I think talking about the prioritization is important mm -hmm. um, because that's a time when you're going to want to say, we've got to do all this stuff and we have to do it now. Mm -hmm. And to be able to give your team, you know, the, the breathing space to say, yes, you know, we do need to do all this now, but this is the most important thing. So mm -hmm. if you can't get everything done, so like, I'm going to be happy if you can at least manage to get that thing mm -hmm. done. Yeah, I think that's huge, the prioritization. What else? I, I think with prioritization, though, you have to give uh, kind of an endpoint or something or a goal. Uh, so a clear goal to meet that, because I have seen leaders do clear prioritizations, but then they don't give an end goal, right? So then all of a sudden, people start to go to the burnout zone because it feels like they're on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's key, right? So what are we prioritizing? Just tasks or are we prioritizing outcomes, what we're getting done, what we're accomplishing? Yeah, and then Cheryl, you said communication. Gosh, there is so much we can't control in the world. We can always control how we communicate. I think that like we can always, always, always control how we communicate about what's happening. And that is not something that we have to let self-inflict pain into our teams and our organizations and the people that we work with. It's hard. It feels like sometimes that communication thing is out of control and we're not always the one in control of it, but it is when there's so much out of control, focusing on what we can control helps us to know what the right expectations are. If you have high expectations around how many people are going to accept foster animals, into their home, you can't actually control that. That is an outcome, an impact of perhaps other things that you do. But if you're setting your high expectations somewhere that you have zero zone of influence around, that's gonna cause low well being, and those are not the right expectations to be setting. Now that might be part of your vision, your mission, your aspiration. It might even be a way that you measure the effectiveness of your actions. Is any of the activity we're doing having an impact and how many people are taking on foster animals, that could be a really good measure of progress, but you don't actually have internal control over it. So setting your expectations around things that you can actually control and understanding the impact of those things can make a big shift. Yeah, great comment, Sabrina, as well. As much as reasonable, be transparent. 
Be transparent. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's the, the like communication part, though, as much as reasonable. So reasonable transparency. Mm -hmm. well, how do you do you start to think about reasonable transparency? Well, I can write the comment in the chat. So, but just you, you can't tell everybody everything. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're in a leadership. Yeah, if you don't have any filter, you're going to create chaos. There's somewhere in the middle here, right? If we think about the Kniffin like model, there's somewhere in the middle where it's just total chaos. If you have zero filter, you're going to create chaos. What were you going to add something to? I was just going to say, uh, maybe considering the cost of not doing something, because really everything is not a priority. Yeah. yeah. And that's a huge way that we start to think about um, prioritization. So cost of not acting, or we can talk about like the opportunity cost, which is often not included in our decision-making by choosing to do this, what won't we do? And is that worth it, right? That comes into play. What else? What other things like might that leader do or might, have you seen in your organizations that keep people in the performance zone? Celebrating. Celebrating wins, okay. Right, that gets down to like this appreciation. Lack of appreciation versus celebrating wins. That has to be specific, right? You can't be generic and stop doing specific. Yeah. Well, gosh, and that comes into all sorts of things. Specificity versus generic um, broad platitudes makes a real difference in whether it is um, genuine, whether there's transparency, and how that impacts <laughs> our experience of it all. It's gotta be oh. yeah. it's gotta be for the right behaviors too. Like, mm. like if you're rewarding the person who's demonstrating hero culture mm -hmm. um, and doing things that lead to burnout and that burnout's out and those are the people that are recognized, that's a problem. Yeah, I'm gonna put that down here in the burnout zone. Hero culture, right? Good work doesn't need saviors. Um, and that perpetuates the idea that, well, the best and the brightest will rise above it. And my job as a manager is just to find those unicorns who never seem to burn out their light and um, can just go on and on and on. It sets up a dynamic that um, can feel, have the appearance, right? This idea of like specious ideas. My book editor said I shouldn't use the word specious in the book and went back and forth and it's in there. You have to figure out what page it's on. But specious, you know, the appearance of something beneficial that in fact is harming us. A lot I would of put hero culture on the, the I would put hero culture on the opposite end as well because I've seen many people even carrying the weight for everybody. No up on top. Oh yeah, uh, oh. yeah. It creates so you have the yeah. one person yeah, doing people. all the work and I, there's I think there's that ad, right, where there's a lady doing all the work and the guys are like watching out the window or something like that. Right. So. Yeah. If you exist in a hero culture in which somebody, one person is actually doing the work, you can appear to be busy and live in the vacation zone at work. That's quite, you know, I mean, that's, that happens, right? It's a good ad. Yes. What else? Any other ideas come to mind? The existence of psychological I, safety helps. Presence of psychological safety, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to add for that is if leaders can. My um, can admit to mistakes, right? And so that helps with that psychological safety to say, hey, you know, I made this mistake or, um, yeah. you know, and not not having this kind of punishing attitude, right? That ends up fitting in that psychological safety. Yeah, I think that really speaks to like the learning culture that happens in the performance zone. Um, because if you have high well-being, high expectations, you might not have the answer to how to get to those high expectations. But if you're in a learning organization, you're part of a learning team, you're going to keep improving towards that. And that's what really makes what's possible unlimited. It's exponential growth that's possible when we operate in this zone. When we really create environments where people can show up and do their very best work, we unlock that power of like the ecosystem, right? Where we're 
really creating things that are greater than just the additive sum of all of our hours in the day. Kind of relates to the mistakes in learning and psychological safety, but like add all those up and you get like uh, vulnerability. Okay. Mm. And so how does vulnerability help with performance? Yeah, um, by being vulnerable, you can make it safe for others to be vulnerable and enable psychological safety and learning and sharing mistakes and transparency. Yeah. And yeah. You know, a lot of this also has to do with the idea that it has to be personal mm. and not seen as the cog. And because you can have celebrations that are not personal, but you are being celebrated. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's that idea of actually feeling that you belong. So it's the idea of belonging, mm. but on a personal level, which requires. Yeah, I mean, that gets right to the heart of showing up as a human, that you're valued because of who you are and the unique contributions that you make in your humanness, not because you're a warm body who has hours to plug into the machine, right? And so that like belonging as a, as a person and who you are as a human uh, makes a huge difference in our well-being which unlocks our capacity for learning and change and adaption, which, you know, leads to that higher performance. I mean, the reason I'm saying that is a lot of what this whole thing really does is really celebrate what is being done mm -hmm. rather than who people are. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of being and people being is pretty critical for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and I think that's something that has to be yeah, and I, you know, I think this comes up a lot. Um, those of you who you know coach and work with other organizations, you might experience this too. I was working with a leader at a like a PR firm this summer, and one of the things she was really concerned about is, okay, it's not just about yes, people need to be happy and healthy at work, but it's not just about doing whatever makes you happy, right? Like that because that gets us to like the vacation folk. And, and we really had to talk about and coach through, you have to set the right high expectations and there has to be accountability. And it is okay to actually say, hey, we've got these expectations for how we work together and you're not meeting them and it's not a good fit because what you need to be happy in your work maybe isn't what we need for how we accomplish our outcome. If you're part of a team that really does require um, you know, a high degree of social interaction and collaboration. And what makes you happiest in your work is sitting with spreadsheets all day long and numbers and data. That is A-OK. -okay. That doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you lazy. It doesn't even make you antisocial. But it might mean that it's not a good fit, right? And there's not a path to your well-being and the high expectations, the outcomes that we need as an organization. Um, and it is OK to acknowledge that. So it's not just about letting everybody do whatever they want to be happy all the time. But it is about saying our high expectations can't cause suffering, right? And if we're not thriving in our work, we're not going to be able to actually deliver what we're actually capable of. So that like being respected and celebrated for who you are, not just what you do is like the foundation, right? And then that enables us to come together and collaborate and create things that are quite remarkable. Right. In other words, you're you're celebrating the virtues or the character traits, the learner, the curious, mm -hmm. the yeah, others, what takes initiative, all those things that actually makes what he does or she does actually good. Right? Yeah, that's such a great way to frame it. I really like that. One of the things that, that hasn't come up here, but I think is incredibly important, and it kind of gets into prioritizing, but I think one of the other things that we miss so often in our organizations is how we manage our work in progress limits or our change in progress limits or our initiatives in progress. Um, but the way that we manage, you know, even if we go back to Cheryl, I love your example of, you know, what's happening in the animal rescue field, right? It's important work. And the capacity of the entire ecosystem has shrunk, which means that we have to manage our work in progress limits because what we can accomplish at any given time might shift and change. And that's challenging, especially when, 
you know, if you're in an animal rescue organization, there's real animals, right? So what does it mean? You know, how do you manage that if you need to say we have a capacity of, you know, X amount of activity? Um, what, you know, that is a challenging dynamic to be in. Um, but at the same time, if you're as a leader not looking at how do you manage um, your work in progress limits as an organization, you're going to burn people out, right? There's, there's still very human limits to how much we can accomplish and do at any given time. And if the work we're doing really matters, the more we pay attention to what can we do at any given time, the more we are able to get more done over time. And I think that that's one of the things that many, you know, all of these things being true in this performance zone, but if you're not putting limits around how much you pursue at any given time at the same time, you will find yourself squarely in the burnout zone. You can do all the other things right, and you will still be stuck in the burnout zone as an organization if you're not paying attention to your work in progress limits. It always makes me wonder when companies do that, if they really know what they're doing, right? Because it's almost like they're throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks, as opposed to having kind of a focus as to what they're doing. <clears throat> My red marker doesn't work for me. That doesn't work either. Where have you seen people managing their work in progress limits or using work in progress limits effectively to stay in the performance zone? I saw it firsthand in the target transformation where CIO came in and looked at 800 projects and they said, This is mm -hmm. crazy. And he dropped it down to 100. Well, now, now we're still, again, back up to mm -hmm. way to make things <laughs> because. And a culture kind of seeps in. Yeah. But um, a lot of it is urban myth, but I know people that were in the room when it happened and 800 down to 120. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. And he said, if it doesn't, this is what we say in retail if it doesn't help us sell socks, why are we doing it? <laughs> right. So he really brought us back to that. Mm -hmm. And now we're building it. Because the like, pervasive culture is so strong, the pressures are so high that we can, again, like do all the other things right and not focus on that and still be stuck um, with a ceiling on what's possible. And it's so counterintuitive. Well, Brandy, I was, when I was reading your book, I was looking for this and I haven't finished the whole book, but a lot of people in order to get into those leadership ranks, they have a partner that takes care of the children. They have a mm -hmm. cleaner that cleans their house. They have executive admins that do everything, for them, including getting lunch, buying them cars. I mean, mm -hmm. these are things that I've actually seen. And then when their executive admins actually talk to their spouses, frequently are women, they're like, oh, we don't want those two worlds to meet. And I actually had a conversation with the CIO of Target and the CIO of Marks and Spencer about this. And they were like, we would be lost with all these people that don't take care of all of these things. They don't necessarily have the same things that the individual contributors need to deal with on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. They have that all paid for and handled. At least every VP that I've ever met, definitely every C suite mm -hmm. individual. They have an army of people mm -hmm. taking the daily tasks off their plate. Yeah, which has a real impact on that individual's change capacity, capital for adaption, and their work in progress, and it's what they can focus on when that's hidden. Well, you know, so you think about like, that's part of the ecosystem, but if that's hidden away, it's not visible in the ecosystem. It gives the appearance and the impression that somehow they are a magical unicorn that has risen above it all, right? Um, and those are realities, right? That either expand or contract what's possible. I mean, they really go into play when you talk about really systemic challenges around why don't we have more women in leadership? Or why are we struggling with, we say diversity and equity is a value of ours and yet somehow it's not translating um, to what our actual um, you know, workforce looks like. And those are some of the things that come into play because you can do all the work, you know, all the work to talk about it, but if you're not actually making the full system visible, um, you're not creating reality, right? And, and so you're still gonna get stuck. In that cycle where you're not really where some are able to appear to do better right it perpetuates the hero culture it perpetuates all sorts of myths about high performance for sure yeah what else where else have you seen work in progress limits in action however imperfectly yeah 
natural genes, however imperfect, uh -huh. in the opposite of Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's like baked right into that team culture. If you're taking seriously your practices as a team, and yet somehow you get outside of the boundaries of the team and it vaporizes, it doesn't apply to anybody else. Yeah. So the couple organizations that I've worked with that do have good balance because they actually collect data about what they're putting out. So it's kind of almost the opposite of those that throw everything in against the wall and see what sticks. They actually know what sticks and they actually know what works because they're actually looking at the data that they're doing, you know, how well are sales doing, how, mm -hmm. when we made this change, did it actually do what we expected it to do or did it not? And I think then they can pivot based off of that. And they're not biased based. So it's not because like some VP went into a store and had a bad experience and now they're going to change the entire system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because it's actual experience from multiple stores, multiple regions that they've gotten uh, and based on the data that they put, you know, changes they've made and then data they're receiving back. Evidence-based management. What was that? It's evidence-based evidence management. Evidence-based management. Yeah. It's a way to make reality visible, right? It's one piece of it. Data is not the only tool that we have to understand reality, but if we're using that to help validate or invalidate the assumptions we're making around what's around us, it makes a huge difference. I mean, well, I'll, I'll, I'll... go ahead. Uh, all I was going to say is along with that, it's, uh, they've, in these couple organizations, they've created a culture where they rely on that data. So it's not because someone has a higher paycheck. It's not because someone has an army that with them. So it's partly the culture too, that that's a kind of an data driven type of a mindset that they have. Yep. Yeah. And that, you know, and so I think that that's another piece that goes right here. The, you know, all this, a lot of this can be described as culture. Right, the environment that we live in, and it makes a real huge difference. Um, well, it's, so it's seven o'clock, which I think is the time that we got to. It's a little after seven o'clock. Um, so I'm going to say this is our body of work tonight. Thank you for participating in it and helping to make it more visible and to add detail to it. Right, this helps us to grow and understand and to think about. Perhaps this is an exercise that you do with the team that you work with. Right, you talk about what keeps us, this space between the performance zone and the burnout zone, right? Like this is where the difference happens and really making it explicit and visible. What are those characteristics that happen in your teams, your organization, or think about that for yourself, right? As individuals, what keeps us here versus here, over here, right? And how do we, um, how do we stay more in this upper area of well-being? Because if the work we're doing matters, how we show up, the well-being we bring to it is the only way towards actual high performance, at least in organizations that any of us probably want to do. So thank you so much for being part of that. Yes. I had this yesterday. I think it was very interesting. Oh, did you? On the team that that drew some massive organization. Right, can you talk louder? Oh, I, I <laughs> actually did this exercise yesterday with an organization that we developed a lot of organizations change. You know, sea level uh, mm -hmm. um, yep. So, so. I love that. Yeah. Um, I think that's great. And I mean, talk about how powerful it would be if you have a room of leaders to get them talking about what their actions, what they do that keep people in the performance zone over the burnout zone. Because that's part of it is as leaders, we have this obligation and this responsibility to create the right environment for our teams. And I think that I'll end with one of the challenges I think that we run into when we talk about burnout is we treat it as an individual problem because it shows up individually, right? We experience it individually and we put the onus of solving it on our individuals. You need to find better work-life balance. You should figure out how to manage your child care and your health and your needs for exercise and eating good food and showing up at work and not working 80 hours a week. That's for you to find balance in, right? I mean, if you're not doing that, what that ultimately leads to is people who are gonna go leave figure out a better way to do that. But if you lead an organization or you care about the mission of the organization that you're part of, we have this obligation to recognize that burnout is an output and an outcome of a system that's creating it. 
And so how we design our organizations, our teams, and our work is ultimately a leadership responsibility so that we create environments where people can do good work and not burn out so we can do the work that matters, right? And so that's my invitation to you. That's what I am so passionate about. And I have stickers. So if you didn't get a sticker already, come get a sticker. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Cheryl has books too. I, have, I, have, I don't know how she's going to duel them out. Some of you know. have your own book. Here's the deal. I had Chris Wickett slew the lady in the background, pulling names out of the bowl for those that get the uh -huh. ebooks. Okay. Way to go. So we have we have five ebooks, Kindle books, ebooks, whatever, Amazon. So um all I ask of those, and I'll call out names here for those that um got the book. First of all, I will need an email from you. So you can um just in you know put in the chat what your email is, or you can send it to me separately, um, you know, because I'm available in our meetup <laughs> group. So I just need an email. And so the winners of the eBooks are Sabrina, Rob, hey. Tina, and uh, let's see, Jamie and Chad. Yay! <laughs> So that's pretty cool. Those are, the, those are the five electronic virtual winners. Okay. And now. And are we doing arm wrestling? The in-person arm wrestling? I don't know. <laughs> no. Okay. Leg wrestling. Leg wrestling. There we go. <laughs> Well, Cheryl's doing that. I'm happy to answer any questions. I said I was gonna, it was very interactive. I said I would make more time for questions and I didn't go to do that. Question? Okay. Since we're all here, yes. we're in a physical environment together. Uh -huh. We all really appreciate you. Could we all have a big round of applause for Randy? Thank you. Um, and Randy, <laughs> you are a writer. So don't say that. <laughs> Thank All you. Right, girl. I've learned how to be a writer. I've learned how to be a writer because <laughs> it's fun. useful. Thank you. You have 22 reviews on Amazon. All of them are fives. Thank you. Uh, anyone who put a review on Amazon, it's author's goal. And as a, as a yes. Cool. Thank you so much. I'm going to let Brandy pick. Hey, Brandy, I'm excited to. I think it's her because I'm happy through and I was like, I think I attended those talk at Tuesday back home like a while ago. Yeah. And I need a 2019 book of wire cups. I, like, I, I love that one. Thank you. Yeah, some of you were thinking that things that turned into a talk that I gave a lot and then became became the book. Yeah. So I was um, reading it. She would want to do that. I remember talking to my manager about it. It didn't go very far, but <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, that was that was where it all started. I had a friend shortly after that who actually came to that talk that night, and then later he was like, "Brandy, I just don't understand why you care so much about organizational multitasking. I don't like why, <laughs> why." And I was like, "Okay." And I had to think about it, right? Like, why do I care so much about this? Why, do, why am I doing this? And that's, that's when this, the seed for the book really emerged was because we put people in positions so they have to choose between doing good work and their own humanity. And so many times that's a child choice. And it shows up as organizational multitasking, right? Um, but it's really about, it, what was that? And anxiety. And anxiety <laughs> and stress. And goodness knows there's just too much good work to be done. We don't have time for that. And, um, and it's so dehumanizing, right? And so that's how those ideas evolved into really realizing that this is a book about high performance, a book about how we actually like, reach our potential as, as teams and as people. And I absolutely believe it's possible. So I love that you were there. How many, how, anyone else? I know Bonnie, you were there. Many of you were there. We played <laughs> the water juggling game. I wish I remembered <laughs> who was juggling the water. I can't remember who was the volunteer. Was it you? Oh, I can't remember. I don't remember oh, either. Room. We got we got some building back to do in our uh, agile meetup crowds. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, we can, we can do it again. We can, the game is, is always fun. Okay, so what are we supposed to do so we can, and I know if you need to take off, you are, of course, welcome yeah, to do so. Um, uh, Cheryl, don't kill the session because I have to get some emails. Make yep. sure you get emails. So, and this worked really well. I mean, those of you who are joining us virtually, I'm looking at your faces, but really, you're going to evaluate, like, <laughs> you know, if this was a, how this experience was for you, but the technology in the room is really great, and it's really lovely to see your faces and looking at all of you now. Really, and I'm sorry I missed you in person. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we'll have to do this again. It's yes. Great in person. It is great. Okay, so I'm picking names out. Yep. Five. Okay, if you already have the book, five. you have to give it to somebody else. Okay, I've got three. Jean. Whoa, Jean. Maria. So you can get a copy to share. Who else do we Oops. have? Amy. Yay. Yay. Okay, two more. Sharon. Okay, and Mikkel. So there you go. <laughs> you can trade, and you want me to throw another name? Okay. Okay, Bonnie, I know you've got a copy too. Many of you guys are so wonderful in supporting <laughs> the book. I have but you, can get a, you get a, I drew your name, so you get another yeah. copy. Give away. Okay, you can pass it on. And I do have lots of stickers. Those of you who are part of the book launch team, you guys got these, but you can get another one. Prioritization is a verb. I love that. That one. Um, humanity isn't a liability. That's one of my favorites. Focus isn't a four-letter word. <laughs> Neither is prioritize. Whip limit rock star. And of course, my favorite better is better. Than so yes. lots of stickers up here. So grab some stickers. Um, I had my children. I'll cut them up earlier today for my big sheet so and thank you all. also take one of these yeah, are these cool these are um supplements of improving yeah cheryl do you have a Minnesota do you have a plug do you have a plug for the next session oh i do have a plug for the next okay. session. thank you um we will on december 15th have kj chow talking about agility mapping and i saw agility this mapping. presentation um with uh, a group last April. And I thought, this is fabulous, really interesting stuff. So um, working with him tomorrow to get information to put out on the site. So yeah. stay tuned. And then <laughs> January, I know that Cheryl's working on something. And then February, maybe I haven't told Sharon about this yet. But oh. we're hoping for like another co women in agile Twin cities with us for like February or March, whatever we can like orchestrate. So it'll be good. That's great. And, if there's and Brandy, anyone... huge shout out to all that you've got. Wonderful book, good stuff, congratulations. Thank you yes. so much, Chris. It's really lovely to share in that celebration with all of you here who are part of my community and I really appreciate it. It's been absolutely gobsmacking, humbling <laughs> to have uh, people read the book and hear from people all over the world. Um, which just really blows my mind. So thank you very much, all of you. Yeah, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right. And if anyone's interested in being part of the organizing committee for these meetups, um, please let one of us know. Um, people, uh, you can see Cheryl there in person. Um, there's also me, the other Cheryl, Angie, and Chris, who are, and Marilyn, who are online. Um, I believe Craig is in the room. Yes. And I don't know if anybody else is in the room for who's part of the organizing committee, but we always want more help. If you have ideas of who you'd like to speak or any of that, let us know or topics. There you go.